Good morning and welcome to the Richland Center Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's nice to have little voices out there. Um, just a couple announcements. Um, first of all, please keep in your prayers those that are at the general conference, including pastor. It'll be from, started on July 2nd and going through the 11th. Um, a lot of important decisions being made there, so please your prayers for them. Um, church board meeting for the month of July has been canceled. Um, we had too many people that are out doing some vacation time and things that way, so we will not meet again until August 13th. Our call to worship this morning is found in Isaiah 40, 28 through 31. Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. He is understand, his understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might. He increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Let us bow our heads. Heavenly Father, Lord, we welcome you here to this worship service. We ask your blessing upon the words that are said this day. We ask for your strength. We ask for your guidance. And we ask that you be with John. Lord, bless us this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our opening hymn is number 76, O Love That Will Not Let Me Go. Hymn number 76. Please stand. Please be seated. It's time for our honor, uh, morning offering. Our offering this week is for the local church budget. A Seventh-day Adventist minister, Leroy Froome, tells us that money is a good servant, but a bad master. It is stored power, a power for evil and when abused. Money can be an even greater power and blessing for good. Faithful stewards use money so that it is a blessing 
both in their lives and the lives of others. A congregation needs God's guidance in their decisions on how to use the funds that are entrusted to it. Today, the offering is for our local church. The offering will support the programs and ministries of this congregation and the upkeep of our facility. Thank you for the, your faithfulness. If the deacons will come forward, please. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank thee for the gifts that you have given us, for the strength that you give us also. Lord, we ask that you take these gifts and help them to grow. Guide and direct this church in your name, I pray. Amen.
Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day, the Sabbath, being Independence Day. Lord, when we think of the freedoms that we have, the freedom to meet here each week, to observe for you openly and not to have to hide. Father, we thank you for those who put their lives out there and um, give us those freedoms. Most people worry about fireworks and things like that this day, but Father, we know the true meaning of this day is to be able to honor you and to live our lives as we uh, want. Father, we thank you for the strength and the courage you give each one of us. We ask your blessing upon the sermon this day and your guidance throughout this week. In Jesus, your name we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is found in Revelations 3, 14 through 22. The lukewarm church, and to the angel of the church of the Laodicean write, these things says the amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot, so then because you are like lukewarm and neither cold nor hot. I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me, buy from me, to buy from me gold and refined in the fire, that you may be rich and white, and white garments, and that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with the eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Good morning. How is everybody this morning? Good, good to see you. Is anybody ha convicted here that they should be the one standing up here preaching today? Because it, it would be okay with me. I'm, I'm, this is a serious offer if God has put it on your heart to come up here and you have a message for us. It's okay if you, if you wanted to. Okay, I'll pass on that then. Is there anything, people out there, that you are passionate about? Just a show of hands, Any, anything you're really passionate about. I'm going to tell you something about that I've been passionate about in the past, something you may not know about me. Um, when I was about uh, 20 years old, um, I traveled up to Minneapolis and I bought a windsurfer and I you know, spent maybe $800 and bought, got, my, got my new toy. Um, you know, and even today, sometimes when the wind's pumping and it's nice and warm out, or I take notice of a windsurfer board in my, in my shed here, you know, I'll get just a little nostalgic about it. You know, and the, of course the thought's tempered because I need a mast base for my windsurfer. Um, but I spent countless hours, I, I read about it, everything that I could learn about windsurfing. You know, I learned how to do all of it. I, I 
learn you know how to how to tack with a sailboard, how to jibe. Um, and a couple of summers over in Lacrosse, I spent all of my time, my spare time, I'd spent it in the backwaters over there by. Uh, anybody know how uh, um, the airport in Lacrosse is set up? It's kind of a, it's on an island, and it was the east shore there, just the backwaters there. It's, so there's, I didn't have to deal with any currents or anything at that place. That's where I learned how to windsurf. And after I got a little better, I spent time out on Lake Onalaska there. And, uh, and as the years progressed, I even go out and dodge the, the barges up going up and down the Miss, uh, Miss, Mississippi River. Of course, fortunately, they don't go very fast. So. You know, I was totally into windsurfing, and you know, and even I still today I get that feeling of excitement at what it'd be like to just get back out there and skim across the the, uh, the lake or river. Before we get started, let's just have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, uh, I just ask for your spirit to be on us all, that your will would be done, and. Uh, May we hear what you want us to hear and take away what you don't want us to hear. Bless each one of us that are here today, and I ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, I just want to preface this conversation here by stating that I, you know, our faith is in, in, in Jesus Christ, and, and that's how our salvation is, by our faith. You know, but faith is not a dead thing. You know, it'll produce a change in our lives. We need to test all things, too, and our faith needs to be in line with truth. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. Today I just want to spend some time going over a message that I know God wants for his people. Dale's reviewed the scripture many times with you in Revelation. God wants us to have a zeal for him, not just mediocrity. He, wants, he doesn't want our leftovers, but wants our full efforts and passion in whatever we do, especially in our relationship to him. Colossians 3, 23 and 24 tells us what approach to take in everything that we do. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for, for you serve the Lord Christ. Living in a society that doesn't respect the precepts of God's word takes more than a lukewarm approach. And if you want to stand for God, especially with what's going on all around us, 1 Kings 19.10 uh, Elijah said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed the prophets with the sword. And I am, and I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Elijah was not popular for pointing out error. He lived during a time where the prophets were killed because they didn't speak easy words because they spoke the truth. In John 17, it says, sanctify them by your truth, because your word is truth. Many people shy away from revelations, but as Dale has been reviewing it over, over many times, it's reminded us that there's a special blessing in the reading of this book. Revelation is the very revelation of Jesus reveals not only the Lamb of God, which John the Baptist pointed out profoundly when he met Jesus, but it uses terminology taken directly from the sanctuary, which is where we learn that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. We learn especially from the Day of Atonement that the application of blood has a cleansing effect on our sins permanently to the point that somehow God is able to no longer remember them. That is is the amazing thing. And I'm so thankful when I confess my sins that he's faithful and just and he forgives them. And I'm not a theologian, okay? I'm 
fact, for some of you don't know me, so I'll just say I, I am an IT professional. My uh, education is in computer science. You might say I'm a bit of a geek. So, um, but I do believe that God's able to use even the weakest of the weak for his purpose. And that's something we really need to take to heart, that God doesn't, isn't looking for some powerful person. He's looking for people to use, people to be filled with him. This world doesn't work the same way that God's kingdom does, so I'm going to just claim a promise now, and uh, because I know I'm not really qualified in any way to stand up here and present something like this. Um, in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10, Paul was relaying some of the difficulties of his experiences, and he says, And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning the thing I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my affirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in my affirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I chose a text today here from the message to the church in Laodicea because I know that I need to be so connected to God that he would say that I have a zeal for him. He said, be zealous. I'm thinking most of you probably want the same. That's why you're here. And I'm going to just go read through Revelations 3, 14 through 22 again. And to the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of creation of God. For those familiar that may have a red letter Bible, these words are being spoken by Jesus. And he's speaking directly to his church. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth, because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, and blind, and naked. We need vision, because we do not know our true condition. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. Jesus here is asking us to go directly to him for what we need. Not going to another for strength and forgiveness, but directly to God. He has something of more value than anything in the world. True riches come from God. The righteousness of Jesus and it's so that the blood of Jesus may, may cover our true condition. And he will anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Job 5.17 says, Behold, happy is the man whom God corrects. Therefore, do not despise the chastening of the Almighty. To be zealous for God involves repentance also. If we want real revival in our lives, both prayer and repentance will be present. Other words for zealous, and I went and I looked this up in the dictionary, is to be fervent, passionate, impassioned, devout, committed, dedicated, hardcore, um, enthusiastic, eager, vigorous, and intense. In verse 20, continuing, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. The thing about Jesus, and we were talking about this a little bit, he is always waiting. He is on a mission, as Dale brought out in Sabbath school, to reach the lost. And yes, reach to reach us. And continuing, it says, If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. Jesus will not force his way in, 
when he's not wanted, okay? But uh, as the gentleman that he is, he is awaiting the invitation with an invitation. He's not willing that anyone should perish. You know, many times I hear people wondering why the coming of the Lord seems so de delayed. You know, I praise God that he delayed in my case. If it weren't delayed at a certain time in my life to come be fully committed to Christ, Jesus knows that there's people around us that are his people. He is not willing that any should perish. God is in control. He is delaying so that one lost sheep is found. Continuing here in verse 21, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So what will it take for us to recognize our need of God? We cannot expect to receive the zeal by our own power, by our own effort, by our own gumption. Um, if it's not attended by his Holy Spirit, only as we come to Jesus, like the disciples at Pentecost did in meeting together in prayer and the reading of his word, I don't really expect a revival until we get that one straight. If we don't get it right, we may not be sure which of the five virgins we're counted among. In the parable of the ten virgins, the ten virgins all were there for the marriage supper. They, they were waiting for the coming of, of their, the bridegroom. Five of them ran out of oil and didn't have enough. In verse 25 here of the parable, it says, Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with the lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. And the conclusion of that parable just says, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Jesus was explaining just that we need to watch. The five virgins that were ready had transactioned their business beforehand. They were prepared for the arrival of the king, the bridegroom. And we're told in this text that we should buy from Jesus that we need, need so that we'll have what we need at, the, at his coming. Matthew 26, 41 says, Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Does anyone have trouble staying vigilant in your prayers? I do many times, even keeping my train of thought when I'm praying. The only thing that we have to transact with God is our dedication of our service in time with prayer, Bible study, and in service to him. His inv invitation is here for us every day. Jesus is at our heart's door always. The question is, will we let him in? Can we know for certain when Jesus will come? Does anybody here know when that will be? 
Mark 13, 32, but concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. However, we can see the trends, and we can see as prophecy is fulfilled. We can observe where we are at, and hopefully it's a motivation for us to take seriously our relationship with God. Matthew 24, 4 through 8, And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of war. See that you are not troubled, for all those things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginnings of sorrows. And as the NIV puts it, it says they're the beginnings of birth pains. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 2 through 24, it says, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us as though that through the day of Christ had come, let no one deceive you by any means. For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. This man of sin is historically attributed to the Antichrist, and I'm going to discuss that just a little bit. The popes throughout ages, they've been called the Holy Father. Matthew 23, 9, scripture reads, and, no, and call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. You know, father is one thing, but Holy Father is another. When the Bible clearly states, there is none holy as the Lord, for there is none besides thee, neither is there any rock like our God. I just want to uh, preface this here by stating that I have a lot of friends that are Roman Catholic. Um, I don't wish any of them any harm. And uh, I see many of my friends on a regular basis, you know. And uh, what I'm stating here is historical information. And I think it's important to recognize scripture and how it's fulfilled as the events of her Earth's history mesh up with prophecy. Today, the current Pope Francis enjoys incredible popularity. In fact, he is the number one largest Twitter account, which is pretty fascinating. In a couple of months, he's going to be here addressing our legislature our legislature here in the United States. It's a pretty historic event, especially considering the where the United States started, why it became to be. Uh, it, was, uh, it was born out of persecution from this power. In this last encyclical also, um, he believes it's for the entire world. Um, he's, he says he's not just teaching for the Catholics, and he is increasingly looked to for the leadership, even among Protestants. In fact, many Protestants, they don't even know what they're protesting anymore. I want to just take a careful look at just a few texts in Revelation 14 and see what God may have to say. The end time issue in Revelation is over worship. Do you pay homage to the beast in Revelation 13 and receive the mark of the beast? Or do you receive the seal of God? God has given us a way to identify and know that we are on his side. Revelations 14, 12, it states the following. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And we know from Revelation 13 and 14 that this is over worship and the commandments. The first four commandments deal with our relationship with God, and we know that his people will be identified by their faith in Jesus and will be commandment keepers. Revelations 12, 17 
Satan is He's mad, he's upset, he's enraged with God's people for what? In Revelation 12, 17, it says, and, and the dragon was wroth with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Revelation 14, 7 echoes the language in Exodus 20 in the fourth commandment as follows. In fact, this commandment is the only commandment with, with a reminder to remember, and it appears to be the commandment that has been largely forgotten. It says, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth, and the sea and the fountains of waters. The fourth commandment reads as follows in Exodus 28 through 11, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy man manservant nor thy maidservants, nor any cattle, nor the stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, is and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. This identification of the papacy is, it's not new at all. And in the 14th through the 17th century, there was a lot of agreement among Protestants at that time. I'm gonna just read some here. This is historical information. It's taken from, from very old books. And it's, I'm reading here a section from a book written by Steve Wolberg, chapter nine in the Antichrist Pro the Antichrist Chronicles. The Reformation in the 1500s literally changed the course of history. It helped move Europe, Europe out of the Dark Ages and led to the rise of true religious freedom. Its original principles eventually found expression in the First Amendment of the Constitution of the United States of America, which teaches that when it comes to religion, the governments of Earth have no right to control the conscience. True Protestantism teaches salvation by grace through faith in Jesus. That's from Ephesians 2.8. And the supremacy of the Bible above the visible church, 2 Timothy 3.16, above traditions, pastors, priests, priests, popes, and the kings. This is from Diabi, I'm not sure I'm saying that right. It's D-A-U-B-I-G-N-E. His, the History of the Reformation in the 16th Century, Book 9, Chapter 6, pages 520 through 524. It also teaches the priesthood of all believers in 2 Peter 2, 9 and 10, and that all peoples everywhere can be saved by coming directly to our Heavenly Father through His Son, Jesus Christ. There is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ. And that's from 1 Timothy 2, 5. What did the major Protestant reformers teach about Antichrist? Whether you agree with them or not, it's important to realize what they taught. The following quotations are not intended to foster ill will toward any human being, for this would be contrary to the teaching of Jesus Christ in John 13, 34, and 35, but rather to simply present what some of the most influential Christian leaders who have ever lived believed about the little horn from Daniel 7, 8, and the power in Revelation 13, 1, and the man of sin from 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. Martin Luther, who was, of course, he was the founder of the Lutheran Church. Luther proved by the revelations of Daniel and St. John, by the epistle of St. Paul, St. Peter and St. Jude, that the reign of the Antichrist predicted and described in the Bible was the papacy and all the people did say, Amen. A holy terror seized their souls. It was Antichrist whom they beheld seated on the pontifical throne. This new idea, which derived greater strength from the prophetic descriptions launched forth by Luther into the midst of his contemporaries, inflicted the most terrible blow on Rome. And this was taken by the same book, The History of the Reformation of the 16th Century. Based on prophetic studies, Martin Luther finally declared, 
we here are of the conviction that the papacy is the seed of the true and real Antichrist. John Calvin, who was Presbyterian, some persons think us too severe and censorous when we call the Roman pontiff Antichrist, but those who are of the opinion do not consider that they bring the same change of presumption against Paul himself, after whom we speak and whose language we ad adopt. Okay, and that comes from uh, Institutes of Christian Religion by John Calvin. John Knox was Scottish Presbyterian. John Knox sought to counteract that tyranny which the Pope himself had to do so many ages exercised over the church. As was Luther, he finally concluded that the papacy was the very Antichrist, the son of perdition of whom Paul speaks. Uh, Thomas Cranmer, an Anglican, uh, lived from 1489 to 1556. Whereof it followed Rome to be the seat of Antichrist and the Pope to be very Antichrist himself. I could prove the same thing by many other scriptures, old writers, and strong reasons. This is by, from the works of Cranmer, volume one, page six through seven. In the interest of time, there's a whole bunch more in here. I'll, I'll read one more here from John Wesley because he was so inter, uh, instrumental in the Methodist church. Speaking of the papacy, John Wesley wrote, he is, an emphatic, is in an emphatical sense the man of sin, sin, as he increases all manner of sin above measure, and he is too, properly styled the son of perdition, as he has caused the death of numberless multitudes, both of his opposers and the followers. He it is that exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped, claiming the highest power and highest honor, claiming the prerogatives which belong to God alone. Many of you may know this already, but um, Pope Francis, he released his encyclical on the care of our common home on climate change. For sure, our earth is groaning from sin. And we're seeing natural disaster at an alarming pace. And even other very strange things, like waters turning to red, rivers turning red like the first plague in Egypt. There's mass animal die-offs. So much now so that National Ge Geographic is coming out with videos and articles and calling them the animal apocalypse. The world knows something's amiss. This encyclical was released in preparation to coming to the United St States where he will address the world meeting of families, the Congress of the United States. He's gonna be here and will do that on September 24th. And will also later be addressing the UN on climate change. As part of his encyclical, Pope Francis highlights the importance of Sunday worship. The day that the Catholic Church has clearly stated that they made the change of moving Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday, and in the encyclical, he states the following. Section six is titled, Sacramental Signs and the Celebration of Rest. And I'm gonna just read a short section in here. It's extremely large, and I haven't read the whole entire thing, but this one jumped out at me. It says, on Sunday, our participation in the Eucharist has special importance. Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath, is meant to be a day which heals our relationship with God, with ourselves, with others, and with the world. Sunday is the day of the resurrection, the first day of the new creation, whose first fruits are the Lord's risen humanity and the pledge of the final transfiguration of all creation, created reality it is also proclaimed the man's eternal rest in God. The problem with this statement here, it's my thoughts, is that God blessed and sanctified the seventh day only. The rest was that, that was on the seventh day, we are reminded in Hebrews 4 that it remains today. 
Hebrews 4 gives us a promise of rest. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he has said. So I swore in my wrath I shall, they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works, and again in this place. They shall not enter my rest, since therefore it remains that some must enter it. And those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience. Again he designated a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time as it has been said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had, been give, had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works, as God did from his. Uh, here is just a testimony taken from the Augsburg Confession that Martin Luther wrote. They, referring to the Catholics, alleged the Sabbath changed into Sunday, the Lord's Day. Contrary to the Decalogue, as it appears, neither is there any example more boasted of than the ch changing of the Sabbath day. Great, they say, is the power and authority of the Church, since it is dispensed with one of the Ten Commandments. And that's from Article 28, um, number 3 of the Augsburg Confession. There are many sources of the Catholic Church making these claims. Um, the day God says we should remember is the seventh day. Do we believe in a thus saith the Lord? For me, even I need to be vigilant in remembering to honor the day. I think that I become lax in my approach. Jesus has stated that he is Lord of the Sabbath, and if I take his claim, his name as a Christian, I have to take him for everything he stands for, not just what is convenient for myself. Otherwise, I believe I am taking his name in vain. And as the commandment says, we're not to take his name in vain. Jesus has said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I thank God that he's given us his word and that Jesus is waiting for each of us patiently at our heart's door He's our creator, our savior, and as our king, Jesus wants our everything. He has given us the Sabbath as a special blessing. An appointment with God is an appointment that can only be kept when we meet on the day that he gave us. Not just any one of our choosing. And if you think that any day will do when he has given us one, is that right? He gave Eve one tree that she should not eat from it. She didn't get to choose which one was forbidden. It was the word of God which established the tree, and it is no different regarding the Sabbath. If anyone in seven will do, then I'll just ask, is it okay if I line up seven women here and just decide which one is to be my wife? You know, I... Uh, I'm sure Mary is not thinking that's right, you know, and that the only one for me to go home with after church is my Mary Lou. In marriage, we're set apart exclusively for each other. Does Jesus want our obedience and our everything? And does he want us to be zealous in our relationship with him? Let's... Uh, Turn to hymn number 465, I Heard the Voice of Jesus. Hymn 465. Jesus say 
come unto me and rest. Lay down, thou weary one, lay down thy head upon my breast. I came to Jesus as I was, weary and worn and sad. place and he has made me glad I heard the voice of Jesus say behold I freely give the living water thirsty one stoop down and drink and live I came to Jesus and I drank all that life-giving stream. My thirst was quenched, my soul revived, and now I live in Him. I heard the voice <coughs> say, I am this dark world's light. And I found in him my star, my sun And in that light of life I'll walk Till traveling days are done Let's bow our heads for prayer Dear kind Father in heaven uh, We come to you just now knowing, dear Lord, that uh, we need more of you. What we need, dear Lord, is something that we can only get through you and from you, through your word, through prayer, through even sharing what you want us to give to the world, to help people to recognize their need of you. We ask, dear Lord, now that you would go with us as we leave here. Bless us, and may we walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen.